When Earthman finally walks upon the sands of Mars, what will confront him in this mysterious new world? Will any of his conceptions of strange and exotic Martian life prove to be true? Will he find the remains of a long dead civilization? Or will the more conservative opinions of present day science be borne out with the discovery of a cold and barren planet where only a low form of vegetable life struggles to survive? These questions will be answered by our space pioneers of the future. In solving the enigma of the red planet Mars, man may find a key that opens the first small door to the universe. Where are we? The idea of a man-made vessel capable of space travel isn't a new one, and it goes a lot further back than you might think. The earliest recorded reference to a working spacecraft is in the ancient Hindu epic Ramayana, which describes large seven-story high flying palaces that can ascend to the upper atmosphere and are powered by the mind. The age of Ramayana is something of a debatable topic, but it dates at least as far back as the 11th century. The Ebony Horse, a part of A Thousand and One Nights, features a flying mechanical horse that can travel to outer space and dates back to the 9th century. In the 1620s, Francis Goodwin wrote The Man in the Moon, the protagonist of which travels to the moon using a flying device powered by wild swans. Wait, what? And then comes Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon in 1865, and then we're in the 20th century. And then it's spaceships galore, starting in 1902 with the Georges Méliès film Le Voyage dans la Lune. That's a trip to the moon for you non-French speakers out there. A lot of early sci-fi films involved going to the moon. The first Men in the Moon, Woman in the Moon, Destination Moon, and who can forget that 1954 Best Picture nominee, Cat Women of the Moon. I'm kidding, it was actually 1953, and it definitely wasn't nominated for Best Picture or any other Oscar category for that matter. Now, by the time the Twilight Zone arrived in 1959, the moon wasn't the only heavenly body of interest. Our imaginations had been captured by other planets, too. In fact, in 156 episodes, the Twilight Zone never once went to the moon. But the Outer Limits did. Men into Space did, too. Even Night Gallery managed to visit the moon, and it wasn't even a science fiction show. No, dear listener, the Twilight Zone had its sights set higher, further, deeper into space. It went to Mars, that glorious red planet, though I guess it wasn't red since it's a black and white show. But before the Twilight Zone got to Mars, it had to make an emergency landing on an asteroid first, and that's where we'll begin tonight. Hey kids, it's Craig, and this is Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast. The first episode we are discussing tonight is Elegy, first broadcast on February 19th, 1960. Now, we immediately know that this is a science fiction episode because the very first thing we see is a beautiful silver rocket ship in space, pointing straight up, flames shooting from the exhaust port at the bottom below those wonderful curvy fins... But wait, it's moving downward. Now my first thought is, okay, they're running the footage backwards to clue us into the fact that the rocket is preparing to land versus taking off. Now, I'm no rocket scientist, but that can't be how a rocket would be approaching a planetary body, right? 
the flames coming out the bottom imply propulsion, not deceleration. Yeah? They'd need retro rockets or landing thrusters, but they'd be pointing in the opposite direction, right? But this is the future, as we'll soon find out, so maybe there's some sort of ionic speed disruption system that isn't visible in the stock footage they're using. I, I don't know. And look, before somebody else leaves a negative iTunes review calling me out for nitpicking too much, let me just point out that this is science fiction, so it's perfectly reasonable to at least briefly ponder the validity of the science on display. I'm not even calling this a strike against the episode. I'm just pointing out that it looks kind of goofy. That's it. Can we continue? So on this rocket are three astronauts, but the hell with them because we've got a forbidden planet alert. Inside that rocket is a bank of lights that are commonly called Pac-Man lights because they look, uh, you get it. They originated in the 1956 science fiction classic film Forbidden Planet, where they served as part of the super high-techy Krell Laboratory. We saw these very distinctive lights in I Shot an Arrow into the Air a few weeks ago, and I'm sure we'll see them again, probably sooner rather than later. So, okay, these astronauts are... Wait, wait, hold on. Houston, we've got a minor Star Trek connection here. Okay, let me preface this by promising that this won't be a recurring segment, because frankly, there are so many freaking connections between Trek and the Twilight Zone that we would never get through them all. Now, if Wikipedia is to be believed, the ambient sound effects in the rocket here are reportedly similar to, if not identical to, sound effects used for the Enterprise Bridge. I just happen to have a Star Trek sound effects CD, which, I don't know, it's one of those things that you buy because at some point you think you're going to need a phaser sound or a transporter sound or a tribble sound or whatever. And that was like 20 years ago, and I've never actually needed it until now. Let's dig in. We're hitting atmosphere. Keep your fingers crossed, Pete. This may be it. It better be. We're about out of fuel. A lot of that sounds like generic sci-fi stuff you'd find in any sound effects library. But there's one right after the rocket lands. That looped electronic droning definitely sounds like something trekkish. Let's scan through the sound effects CD. <laughs> There. That's a track called Bridge Sequence Number 2. It has other sounds layered on top, but you can definitely hear that same droning sound from Elegy. So it seems Wikipedia was right. The Twilight Zone did in fact use sound effects that would later be used and become downright iconic on Star Trek. But this just opens up more questions. Where did the sound effects originate? The Twilight Zone was CBS, Star Trek was NBC. Did the networks pull from a common sound effects library back then? I mean, I don't think they did, but... Okay, so there are these three astronauts. But wait, wait, hold up. Before we identify them, what is up with those uniforms? Normally, the Forbidden Planet uniforms are used whenever there's a spaceship crew in the story. They're basic, but not cumbersome. These look like diving suits from the 1930s. All those puffy, oversized, ribbed sections are just confusing. I get the ones around the neck, since we can presume that those somehow connect to the helmets, which we never see, damn it. But the ones around the elbows and the knees? 
Do humans in the 22nd century have really delicate elbows and knees that require extra padding? And those big, thick black belts, which have multiple buckles on the back, do they have to buckle each other up every time they suit up? Oh, and they're also rocking the obligatory silver wristbands and matching silver boots. Because, you know, future. Actually, those match the silver rocket nicely. And coordination is key, right? I mean, I don't know. If the goal was to make them look as different from 1960s astronauts as possible, they pretty much nailed it. Okay, for real this time. This is a crew of three. Incredible. Conditions identical to Earth, and yet we're 655 million miles away from Earth. Kurt Myers is played by Jeff Morrow, who was already sci-fi and monster kid royalty by the time he appeared on The Twilight Zone. He played Dr. William Barton in the second Creature from the Black Lagoon sequel, The Creature Walks Among Us, in 1956. But more importantly, he got his forehead enlarged and played the one, the only, the irrepressible Exeter in This Island Earth in 1955. You have successfully accomplished your task, Dr. Meacham. You've assembled an interocitor, a feat of which few men are capable. Who are you? I'm called Exeter. I'm a scientist like yourself. Shall we say, uh, a colleague. My colleagues don't materialize out of strange machines. They're flesh and blood. And so am I, Dr. Meacham, as I hope you'll soon find out. Although I admit at the moment I do appear immaterial. But no matter. Jeff Morrow's final role was on the new Twilight Zone in 1986, in the episode A Day in Beaumont. Nice nod to Charles Beaumont there. He played a character named H.G. Orson, which sounds a lot like an amalgam of H.G. Wells and Orson Wells. Hey, they're both Wellses. Well, what is it this time? Dinosaurs? Giant ants? Tarantulas as big as houses? Son, if I sent that story out on the AP wire, Mr. AP himself would come out here and rip out my teletype with his own bare hands. A day in Beaumont would constitute another Forbidden Planet alert if we were covering it proper. It's about an alien invasion in 1955, the aliens of which arrive in a flying saucer that looks a hell of a lot like the C-57D, even though it's a horrible primitive CGI version. The planet Altair IV is also mentioned. I should also point out that Beaumont's neighboring town is called Matheson. Wait a minute, Pete. These instruments could be wrong. Captain James Weber is played by Kevin Hagen, who will return to the Twilight Zone for season five's You Drive. Hagen appeared mostly in westerns, a career path that eventually led him to semi-immortality as Doc Baker on the long-running Little House on the Prairie series. Normally, a graduating doctor is younger. Ready to take on the world. 20.95 parts oxygen, 78.09 nitrogen. I don't get it. That's air. The brash young Peter Kirby is played by Don Dubbins, who, despite acting on television for over four decades, never landed an ongoing role that lasted more than three or four episodes. Still, he built up an impressive list of credits, appearing in one-offs on almost every single show on the air from the 50s through the 80s. He also appeared in a couple of notable films, including, a hey, speaking of Jules Verne, First Men in the Moon in 1958. This is the beginning of something that man has dreamed about ever since he dropped out of the trees and started walking about on two legs. He walks across a street, or he starts to climb a stair, and all of a sudden some silly accident has taken his life. We run that same chance, but it won't be a silly accident. This is something worth trading your life for. That sounds like the Rocket Brigade training video. Dubbins was also in 1960's The Illustrated Man, which provides us with a tasty Ray Bradbury connection. But what does Ray Bradbury have to do with Elegy? Keep listening. Now, Serling tells us that this ship and its crew are lost in space, far from Earth, and they're almost out of fuel. They have no choice but to land on the nearest asteroid and hope for the best. 20.95 parts oxygen, 78.09 nitrogen. I don't get it. That's air. Gravity. Unit one. It's incredible. 
Conditions identical to Earth, and yet we're 655 million miles away from Earth. So our three intrepid astronauts exit the ship and find a 20th century farm, complete with a tractor, a big pile of hay, and what appears to be a stuffed dog just sort of hanging out by the well. Now, I don't mean a stuffed dog as in a stuffed animal. I mean it in the taxidermological sense. You mean we're on Earth 200 years ago? It's an interesting theory, Pete, and as possible as any other, except that to my knowledge, Earth has never had more than one sun. So they've landed on tattooing, then? Sorry, sometimes my inner Star Wars nerd just has to make himself known. They then notice a farmer behind the big pile of unbaled hay. He's standing perfectly still, eyes wide open, but is completely non-responsive to their questions. What's the matter with him? Seems to be in some sort of a trance, or... Let's get out of here. They run. No, seriously, they run. They, like, hightail it out of there, looking back a few times to make sure that the immobile statue man isn't coming after him. And this strikes me as hilarious. I mean, there's literally no threat here, but whatever. A bit later, they spot another guy. This one's fishing from a river near the biggest specimen of pampas grass I've ever seen. And like the farmer... He's not moving at all. Kirby touches him, and he falls over, eyes still wide open, apparently in the same trance as the farmer. Then they hear music and go to check it out. They find a band in uniform, instruments at the ready, but frozen in place. The music is actually coming from a loudspeaker on the wall. They venture a bit further in and discover a large group of people celebrating the inauguration of their new mayor. They're all frozen, too. Well, I suppose it could be some sort of illusion. Yes. Maybe we're being made to see and hear what we hope to find. The sights and sounds of home. Hey, you know, we're seven minutes into the episode, and not once has somebody asked if this is all a gag. Or it could be that time itself is suspended here. Or time may have, in a sense, have speeded up for us or slowed down for them. You mean they might actually be moving? It's possible. Then why can't we see it? Well, you, you don't see the movements of a clock's hands. Nevertheless, they do move. Carl, do you really believe what you're saying? No. Of course not. But they're not just statues. They're flesh and blood. Or something that feels like flesh and blood. The men decide to split up and look around individually for an hour. And they each find different tableaus of frozen people doing various things. One man is on the verge of winning a fortune in a poker game with a royal flush. Another man is having a romantic encounter with a much younger woman serenaded by a trio of violin players. A woman is being crowned the winner of a beauty pageant, having apparently beaten out other, much more attractive women. Your Majesty, I don't blame the judges. You're the prettiest of them all. Okay, I... I can't tell if he's being serious or if he's just being a facetious dick. I mean, she's obviously considerably less attractive, I mean, by shallow societal standards, than the other contestants. But tell me something, Your Majesty. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with everybody in this crazy place? Answer me. Can't you talk? Can't you move? Answer me! He storms out. A member of the audience, a smiling old man, suddenly turns and watches him leave. That's right, he turns and watches them leave. He ain't frozen, folks. In fact, he's so spry and lively that he's got his own sprightly theme music. That's a bit earwormish, right? Now the men regroup and continue wandering around. Everyone they see, a man mowing a lawn here, an ice cream vendor there, is frozen stiff. Well, as for me, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. Like it or not, this is home from now on. Oh yeah, that's right. They're out of fuel, so they ain't going anywhere. Hey, 
we just met another trio of astronauts stranded on a lifeless asteroid just a few weeks back, and I shot an arrow into the air. But this asteroid isn't a harsh desert environment. This one's civilized and fully furnished. Not sure if there's potable water, though. The men come upon a large house. Charming. Lovely, isn't it? If you want it, it's yours. Yes, that's true, isn't it? They approach the house. There's an old man on the porch, the same old man we saw earlier that wasn't frozen. He reveals himself to them, much to their shock and awe. My name's Wickwire, Jeremy Wickwire. Oh, come, gentlemen, there's nothing to be afraid of. Truly there isn't. But you're real. Well, of course I am. Isn't everybody? I used to think so. Oh, you mean, <laughs> do come inside. Come on, won't you? Come on, come inside. There's nothing to be afraid of, I assure you. Jeremy Wickwire is played by Cecil Kellaway in the first of two Twilight Zones. We'll also see him in season four's Passage on the Lady Anne, which was written by Charles Beaumont, who also wrote the episode we're talking about right now, but we'll deal with him soon enough. Now, Monster Kids will no doubt recognize Cecil Kellaway from his work in The Invisible Man Returns and The Mummy's Hand, both in 1940. But to me, he'll always be Matthews, Ethel Barrymore's sidekick in the 1946 classic Portrait of Jenny. There's a quality about the girl that reminds me of uh, long ago. And there ought to be something timeless about a woman. Something eternal. You can see it in all the great portraits of the past. They make you feel you could meet those women anywhere and be inspired by them. I talked a bit about Portrait of Jenny here on the podcast last fall, at which time I lamented the fact that it was the only film in my top 10 all-time favorites that hadn't been released on Blu-ray. Well, oh, what a difference a year makes. It's finally coming out on Blu-ray next month from Kino Lorber. If you've never seen it, seek it out. Portrait of Jenny is a beautiful, brilliant, strange love story. You're in for a rare treat. Now you tell us one thing right now. Where are we? Why, you're in a cemetery. Didn't you know? Wickwire breaks out some wine for his guests. To peace, my friends. To everlasting, eternal peace. Excellent. Libra milk, isn't it? Yes. As you might recall, our pal Fred from the Twilight Pwn podcast is a singer-songwriter who records under the moniker Golden Suits. He cleverly snuck a Twilight Zone reference into one of his songs, as he explained to us last fall. Has anything from the Twilight Zone kind of surfaced in your songwriting? Well, <laughs> actually one thing very literally has, and there's probably like a more intellectual answer to this, but there's a very specific answer, which is that I, when I watched the episode Elegy, there's a little bit at the end where the astronauts are trying some wine that Wickwire, the <laughs> robot, sorry, spoilers, uh, gives to them to try. And they're tasting it and they say, oh, blah, blah, blah. And it's hard to understand what they're saying. But if you look at the closed captioning on Netflix, what they're trying is something called Liebfraumilch, which is a white wine that comes from Germany. So I thought that was a cool word. I study German, I'm interested in it. And so, I was like writing this song and I was like, I had this one line in it that needed like a reference to Germany because the song is about a trip I took to Germany. And so the line I wrote in it was Liebfrau Milch in Germany. And that's because of a reference to Elegy. And so it literally, a stupid, silly reference to Elegy <laughs> worked my way, it worked its way into one of my songs. I was in bed with a fever reading through your text. Okay, so they drink the Liebfraumilch. Now this will be important in a minute. They drink the Liebfraumilch. At least I uh, assume it's important, because the following music cue plays while they drink it. <laughs> Uh, 
Now, underscore in TV and films is oftentimes very effective at subtly underlining the action on the screen and acting in an almost subliminal fashion to telegraph events or plot twists to come. Now, there is nothing even remotely subtle about this. It's almost comical because it creates such a disconnect between what we're seeing and what we're hearing. You see, when you arrived here, I thought you were the men from Happy Glades. But by your behavior, of course, I could see you couldn't be. We're still not following you. What's Happy Glades? The world's greatest mortuary. Uh, At least, that's what it used to be. You see, the management hit upon this scheme as a service to those who could afford it. The scheme being this little asteroid, where we would recreate the exact conditions under which the dear departed could be most happy. For an example, if the deceased always wanted to be elected mayor, he would achieve his ambition here for all eternity. You mean those people are all dead? Uh, No, no, not all of them, just a select few. The others are imitations. And then Myers drops the following. In other words, this is the place where your dreams come true after you've stopped dreaming. Back when I first discovered The Twilight Zone in syndication in the early 1980s, Portland's KPTV-12 would run promo commercials for the show, which used clips from various episodes. I remember one had a ton of elegy clips in it, including that line. And it almost sounds like something you'd hear in one of Rod Serling's opening narrations. A dimension of sight, of sound, of mind. A place where your dreams come true after you've stopped dreaming. But a cemetery out in space, millions of miles from Earth. Why? Your boss could have bought a piece of desert. Oh, no, no, you don't understand at all. Happy Glades promises eternal peace, everlasting peace. You couldn't have that on Earth. Now, could you? He has a point. Uh, what about you? How do you figure in all of this? Why, I'm the caretaker. It's my job to make sure that our guests are not disturbed. Wickwire is giving Captain Weber a bit of a stink eye when he says that last line. It seems these guys are not entirely welcome. Well, uh, when did... This mortuary, or whatever it is, begin? 1973, I believe. Uh, Yes, yes. Captain Weber observes that that would make him over 200 years old. Now I'm afraid you're forcing me into a rather embarrassing admission. You see, I'm not actually human. Oh, I, I am now, but when you've gone, I shall go back to sleep again until I'm needed. You see, I'm... I'm merely a scientific device. I go on and and off again, like a machine. You understand. And then things get a bit weird. The guys seem a bit sluggish, sweaty. Basically me after climbing one short flight of stairs. They quickly realize that, OMG, they've been poisoned. We meant you no harm. I realize that. And I'm sorry. Truly, I am. The antidote. Give us the antidote. There is no antidote, Captain. Even now, the eternifying fluid is coursing through your veins. But it it won't be painful. I assure you. But why? Why us? We then get an extreme close shot of Wickwire's face. Reminds me of that close-up of Orson Welles at the beginning of Citizen Kane, when he utters that immortal word. Rosebud. Because you are here, and you are men. And while there are men, there can be no peace. We dissolve to the interior of the rocket. The men are positioned at their stations, taxidermied all to hell, just like all the other dead people interred at Happy Glades. Wickwire enters and tidies up the tableau with a feather duster and, I don't know, he's probably got a bottle of Windex in his back pocket or something. 
Elegy was written by Charles Beaumont, which he adapted from his own short story of the same name, first published in the 1953 issue of Imagination Magazine. I would read it for you, or have a guest show up to read it for you, but yeah, you guessed it, Tom Elliott already did that over on his podcast. He had Jim Moon from the Hyper Noob podcast do the honors. I love that name, Hyper Noob. Now, our rule here is if Tom already did it, we won't. So I will post a link in the show notes to Tom's podcast. Now, Elegy isn't a bad story by any means, but it is highly derivative of Ray Bradbury's 1948 short story, Mars is Heaven, which would later appear in his Martian Chronicles as the Third Expedition. In Bradbury's story, an Earth ship lands on Mars and is surprised to find an early 20th century American town, complete in every detail. And as they investigate, each crew member encounters members of their own families, siblings, parents, grandparents, who died on Earth but seem very alive on Mars. The crew splits up to be with their loved ones, and during the night, the captain realizes the best way hateful Martians could deal with unwanted visitors would be to manipulate them telepathically. Just then, each of the crew members is murdered in their sleep, and the next morning, there are 18 freshly dug graves. Now, obviously, Jeremy Wickwire isn't using telepathy, nor is the Happy Glades asteroid anywhere near Mars. The elaborate cemetery idea is new, the end result is the same. The Earthlings are duped and then killed. And Beaumont's story just feels like a Bradbury story. And this bugs me a little bit because, as I reported a few weeks back, Bradbury got into a bit of a tiff with Serling with regards to appropriating other writers' material. Beaumont and Bradbury were friends, so I don't know, maybe this was more of an homage? Charles Beaumont is probably my favorite writer on The Twilight Zone, after Rod Serling, of course, so it pains me to admit that I'm not all that fond of Elegy. Now, I'm talking about the episode now, not the short story. For me, it just kind of lays there. The beats in which we're supposed to feel tension seem, I don't know, off somehow. It's a rhythm thing, which I know it sounds a bit goofy, and I wish I could describe it better. My biggest gripe with the episode is the original music score by Nathan Van Cleve, which also bums me out because I'm normally a big fan of his stuff. His score for season three's The Midnight Sun is one of my favorites. Now, I mentioned the story beats. It's like the actors couldn't quite deliver the goods to convincingly convey fear or tension or anger, so Van Cleve went a bit overboard with the music to compensate. There's a lot of brass, which seems kind of out of place in a sci-fi story. Some of the music reappears in Season 2's Shadow Play, and it works a lot better there. There's also quite a bit of it in 22. It's just so forced, melodramatic. It's like something out of Dragnet or Perry Mason. mesh well for me. Now, the slower, creepier cues are fine. I mean, I quite like this one. And this one. And Van Cleve does this cool thing several different times that sounds like a note being played in reverse, which I don't know, maybe that's exactly what it is. But then it usually leads into these over-the-top stingers like the one I played earlier, which kind of kills it for me. This one. But 
sometimes you get the reverse note and it just cuts off. So it just kind of hangs there. Yeah, I like that much better. Now, when I covered Elegy in my blog, I talked about my misgivings about the score. A chap named Dale posted the following counterpoint in the comments section. And now I want to put in a good word for the music, which in my experience of it actually describes the situation the astronauts find themselves in quite well, which is also saying that it is properly programmatic, a thing out of fashion these days, but when considered in context should come off in good esteem, not counting the stock scores of the brass band, string trio or quartet, and beauty pageant, there seem to be two components, that of the astronauts and that of Mr. Wickwire, a comical yet also tragical figure in that he must follow through with an option of last resort in light of the presence of humanity. So, the initial elegiac figure, which also contains elements of discord, indicating that the astronauts have landed on a cemetery, A, outside their understanding, and B, not theirs to access and the comical figure relating to the affable, yet also dauntingly responsible Mr. Wickwire, there coming to be some overlap between the two musical indicators in the course of events. So I give Van Cleve major credit here for couching the proceedings in music appropriate to the action according to the implications of the title, Elegy. He's actually telegraphing the disposition of the episode without giving the game away. Nice touch. You know, I really appreciate hearing that kind of measured, non-combative, non-snarky approach when someone completely disagrees with me. You know, some iTunes reviewers could learn a thing or two from cool guys like Dale. Is he right? Am I wrong? I don't know. Can't we both be right? <laughs> How can it be bullshit to state a preference? Elegy is the third episode we've covered that was directed by Douglas Hayes. Now, as I've observed before, he seems to be the guy they called upon when an episode needed a little something extra. Maybe a bigger scale or a particularly elaborate effect or set. Here, he was responsible for coordinating large groups of people and coaching them to stand absolutely still. They could have easily used mannequins. In fact, it probably would have been cheaper because you don't have to pay mannequin scale. Maybe not for the actual corpses, but for all the artificial people that populate the various tableaus. Hayes instead opted to use real live extras for all of it. Now, he wisely keeps the camera moving most of the time to kind of distract you from seeing unintended movement, but you can still see people twitching or swaying or breathing here and there. I do admire the effort, and the scale of the thing is impressive, particularly in the mayoral election display, which is really sprawling and elaborate. Again, my issues aren't with the production. It's as handsomely mounted as any we've seen so far. I just... I... I don't know. I, I just don't connect with this episode. I don't hate it. I just don't like it that much. If Bradbury himself had written it, and if it had different music, who knows? I might just love it. There's only one actual Ray Bradbury episode in the entire five-year run of The Twilight Zone, which is really unfortunate, even more so if you know why. When Serling was first putting together The Twilight Zone, he didn't have much experience with science fiction. So he, you know what, I'm going to let Mark Scott Zickery, who knew Bradbury personally, tell us more. He writes uh, the various pilots for Twilight Zone that fi and finally gets one of them greenlit as a series. And as soon as that happens, he calls Ray Bradbury, who by then is, of course, one of the great science fiction writers in America. And uh, he says, I, I don't know anything about science fiction. Uh, help me. <laughs> Educate me. And uh, uh, Ray says, well, come over to the house. So that night, 
Rod went over to Ray's house, and he and Ray took him into the basement where his office was, and he said, okay, and he walked up to the bookcase, and he, and he pulled out several books, and one was by himself, and one was by his protege, Richard Matheson, and another was by his protege, Charles Beaumont, and the final one was a book by John Collier, a British short story writer uh, who wrote many wonderful and strange short stories, and he said, read these, and then let's talk. And uh, so Rod did, and from those books, he hired Matheson as a writer on Twilight Zone, Beaumont as a writer on Tri Twilight Zone, they became two of the major writers, and Rod clearly intended for Ray to start writing for Twilight Zone as well, that he would be one of the major writers as well. But then things started to go a bit awry, and where it started was Rod's pilot to Twilight Zone was called Where Is Everybody? And it's about a man wandering uh, a, a, a vacant town and there's no people and he doesn't know who he is and he doesn't know where everyone's gotten to. And finally he uh, collapses and when he uh, comes out of that, he finds that he's actually a, um, an astronaut trainee in an isolation experiment and he's hallucinated the whole thing. So shortly after um, this time, after that got shot, uh, suddenly, um, Rod's in bed with, with Carol one night, and he realizes, oh my God, inadvertently, I was inspired by a short story by Ray uh, in the Martian Chronicles. It's, called, it's a story called The Empty Towns, where all of the human settlers on Mars have gone back to Earth uh, when there's a, a threat of a nuclear war on Earth. They've gone back to their, their home, and there's a, the, sort of the last man on Mars is <clears throat> wandering all these empty towns looking for other people. So Rod calls Ray immediately and says, I'm, I'm so sorry, I inadvertently uh, ripped off your story, and I, I want to make good. I want to, I want to pay you for it and, and, and acknowledge that it was your work. I'm going to have my lawyer call you, and we'll work out a payment, and, and I just want to have this be you know, fair and square. So Ray said, okay, fine. But, uh, but then the lawyer never called. Now, in all likelihood, because you know Rod was writing a gazillion scripts and and running the show and executive producer and just getting the show going, you know he probably gave the dictate to his his lawyer or his team and nothing happened and he wasn't on top of the fact that nothing happened. So a lot of stuff when you're running a show and you're in the hurly burly of that, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, incredible maw of production, things can readily fall through the cracks. So that's very possibly what happened. Uh, Ray writes, "I sing the body electric," and he says to Serling. Um, I'll write this, but you must not touch a word of it. You must film it exactly as I wrote it. So, uh, so Rod says, fine. So that was, of course, back when you didn't have VCRs, you couldn't record a show. And so the show's going to air, and Ray has a big party with all his friends, because he loved television, he loved movies, he loved radio, loved comics. All, his stories were adapted in all these different media wonderfully well. And, uh, and he was thrilled. He was excited. And, of course, he'd been seeing all of his protégés writing for Twilight Zone. So I'm sure that that was all a part of it as well. Twilight Zone was very much a, a subject of conversation. So, um, so he's there at the party with all of his friends. And unbeknownst to him, uh, they, the, the episode had run over, over Lee Long over time. And they'd had to cut it. Uh, and what they'd cut... Un unwittingly and unfortunately it was the one page that was Ray's reason for writing the story and so he sits down to watch it with his friends and that page is missing you know and a page is only about a minute of, of screen time so it wasn't a huge excision but they, and they but they hadn't informed him so the episode airs and Ray's there with his friends watching it and he is appalled he is apoplectic that his work has been cut and he said that's it I'm done I'm done I'm done I'm done and it was a shame. It was a shame because these two men, you know, had they had a fruitful working relationship, there's so many Ray Bradbury stories that would have been terrific Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, Ela from the Martian Chronicles, many of the Martian Chronicles stories, on and on. You can just name dozens of Ray Bradbury stories that would have been terrific. And, and you know, Ray didn't speak publicly about this and because he was a gentleman and a, and a, and a good man. That's an excerpt from Mark Scott Zickrey's YouTube channel, Mr. Sci-Fi. I'll post a link in the show notes to the full unedited video. Some really interesting stuff there. And really sad, too. Ray Bradbury is one of my all-time favorite authors, and the thought of more Twilight Zone episodes by him... Uh, the mind reels. In The Twilight Zone Companion, Zikri actually sums it up really nicely and, appropriately, uses a science fiction trope to frame it. Perhaps in some alternate universe, there was a long and fruitful working relationship with Bradbury that included Twilight Zone adaptations of Mars is Heaven, The Velt, A Sound of Thunder, Kaleidoscope, and many, many more. But not in this universe, and that's a shame.
We now extricate ourselves from the constraints of linear time and advance ourselves into the far off future to our next episode, which is actually not far off at all. Our second episode originally aired on March 25th, 1960, a mere five weeks after Elegy. These are the closest bookend episodes we've seen yet. In fact, they may be the closest we'll ever see. This one is called People Are Alike All Over. The blasting area will be cleared by 0200. Repeat, the blasting area will be cleared by 0200. Speaking of I shot an arrow into the air, this one starts exactly the same way, with a rocket on a launch pad. Two men stand nearby behind a chain link fence, looking up at it. Marcuson, are you afraid? I don't think so. Are you? I am. I'm frightened of what we'll find up there. Well, that's the one thing you shouldn't be frightened of. Well, the unknown, sure. The loneliness, the silence. That should scare anybody. But I've got a philosophy about people. They're the same all over. Well, I'm sure that when God made human beings, he developed them from a fixed formula. They'd be the same here on Earth as in the furthest reaches of space. People on Mars. Wherever they're able to exist, they'd be the same. So this rocket's only got a crew of two. The pilot is Warren Markison, and the guy playing him is Paul Comey in the first of three Twilight Zone appearances. You'll also find him co-piloting the plane in the Odyssey of Flight 33 and shrinking Steve Forrest's head in the parallel. And I mean that in a psychiatric way. He's not actually shr- You know what I mean. Trekkies might remember him from the classic Trek episode, Balance of Terror, where he played Lieutenant Stiles, who was basically a racist dick. We know Outpost 4 has been attacked, sir. So if we intercept Romulans now... After a whole century, what will a Romulan ship look like, Mr. Stiles? I doubt if they'll radio and identify themselves. You'll know, sir. They're painted like a giant bird of prey. I had no idea that history was your specialty. Family history. There was a Captain Stiles in the Space Service then. Two commanders, several junior officers. All lost in that war, sir. Their war, Mr. Stiles. Not yours. Don't forget it. See, he hates Romulans because they massacred his family, and since Vulcans and Romulans are nearly identical genetically, he hates Spock too. Now, Spock ends up saving his life, which kind of turns him around. Sorry, I I know, this is a Twilight Zone podcast. No more Trek connections. The other guy, the frightened biologist, is Samuel Conrad, played by a very young Roddy McDowell. He would, of course, go on to achieve legend status playing Cornelius and later Cornelius' son Caesar in the original Planet of the Apes film series. It was at this level I discovered cutting tools and arrowheads of quartz and the fossilized bones of carnivorous gorillas. But the artifacts lying here were found at this level and date back uh, 700 years earlier. That's the paradox. For the more ancient culture is the more advanced. And hey, Paul Comey has a bit part as a cop in the fourth Apes film, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. They're even in a scene together. Here, McDowell is playing Caesar, son of Cornelius, and Ricardo Montalban is trying to protect his true identity. Comey is the suspicious cop. Lousy human bastards! Who said that? I did. He's a uh, performing ape uh, for my circus. A talking ape? No, no, no. No, that's impossible. It was I who spoke. It didn't sound to me like your voice. Yell, lousy human bastard. That's not what I said. That's what I heard. Now look, mister, you yell, lousy human bastards. Lousy human bastard. We said yell! Lousy human bastards! Yeah, yeah. I hope they joked around on the set about their shared Twilight Zone experience. Roddy McDowell also had a recurring role as Bonchon Louis, the proprietor of the Monkey Bar in the criminally underrated TV series Tales of the Gold Monkey in 1982. No one's watch is more accurate than the executioner's. (laughs) I've never known why it mattered. So the prologue ends with the unnamed rocket blasting off, and when we come back from commercial, we see the capsule approaching Mars, 
We then see an explosion accompanied by Mr. Death's signature cue from One for the Angels. Okay, that's not originally what that was composed for, and it actually shows up throughout the series for various non-death related purposes, but it kind of unintentionally provides that added layer of subliminal dread, at least for me, because that's what I associate it with. It makes me think that death itself might be awaiting Sam and Marcuson as they approach Mars. I mean, that would make it a really short episode, but... Now, the explosion is supposed to represent one of two things. Either there was an explosion aboard the capsule, which caused it to crash, or something went wrong upon re-entry, and the explosion is the crash itself. Either way, they came down hard. The interior of the ship is a jumble of damaged equipment, and unfortunately, a damaged pilot. But we're going to put a pin in that for a bit because... That's right, we've got another Forbidden Planet alert, and it's the exact same one we saw in Elegy. It's the Pac-Man wall lights again, presumably serving a similar function on this rocket, whatever that may be. I mean, seriously, they don't just kind of look like Pac-Man. They look exactly like Pac-Man. And I don't mean because it's a circle with a wedge cut out. Even the circumference isn't perfectly smooth. If you look closely at one, you'll see that it's actually a series of short straight lines arranged to form something more or less circular, just like the original 8-bit Pac-Man. Now, there's nothing in Pac-Man's history to suggest that his design was inspired by the Forbidden Planet prop, but come on, they're frickin' identical. So the rocket is a mess. The camera pans slowly across the internal wreckage, which is really well done, by the way, until we land on Sam Conrad, hanging unconsciously tangled up in what looks like a chunk of scaffolding. He comes to. Marcuson. He digs around in the wreckage until he finds Marcus and pinned beneath what looks like an air mattress, still strapped into his pilot's chair. He's out cold. Sam fetches the med kit and gives him an injection to wake him up. Any landing you can walk away from, remember? What about the ship? Oh, the air pressure seems to be holding up. I got the lights running. I haven't had time to check anything else. Huh? You, you uh, rest for a while. There's plenty of time. Plenty of time? All right. All right, we'll see. Just then, a pinging sound is heard, as if someone or something is banging on the rocket from the outside. Marcuson passes out again, and when he wakes up, Sam is listening intently at the exit hatch, which is conspicuously closed. Marcuson drags himself over and pushes the button to open it. You won't be able to open it. The hydraulics are. I'll put her on the auxiliary, then. We can open it? No, we can't. Open the door, Conrad. I've already told you that door You're won't... You're a liar. You can open the door. Why, Sam? Why won't you open the door? I don't want to open it. Why not? Because... Look, I want out. I want you to open the door now. You can lock it behind me. Just help me up. That's all I ask. Please, help me up. He tries to pull himself up and falls back. Sam, I'm busted up inside. I think I'm bleeding in there. Listen, Sam, I don't want to die in here. I want to see what I'm dying for. Take me out, will you? Take me out. Mark, please, don't. Please. Don't be afraid, Sam. I get a strange hunch. If there's anybody out there, they'll help you. As long as they've got minds and hearts, that means they've got souls. That makes them people. And people are alike. They're bound to be alike. Don't leave me alone, Ma. Don't leave me alone. You said whatever is out there is just like us. Well, I don't know that. Well, I don't want to know. 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 Just then, the hatch begins to slide open, seemingly of its own accord. Sam pulls out a pistol, and when the music peaks, we cut to commercial. At 
this is one of the better act break cliffhangers we've seen. Oftentimes they can be a bit forced or melodramatic, but this is a really organic kind of tension. Sam is scared as hell, determined to delay first contact as long as possible, and here his hand is being forced by whoever, whatever, is outside. Now we come back from the commercial and... We hear Mr. Death's signature cue from One for the Angels again. Perhaps death itself awaits Sam outside the rocket. Or... Maybe not. It's a big group of humans who apparently just walked off the set of a biblical epic. Now, let's see. King of Kings was probably shooting around this same time. We've got togas. We've got sandals. And... We've got the luscious Susan Oliver. That chick that won't quit. It's like stacked, like beautiful. You got me straight tripping, boo. Susan Oliver is probably best known to genre fans from The Cage, the original unaired Star Trek pilot that was later used as flashback footage in the two-part Trek episode, The Menagerie. She played both Vina, a human, and in a hallucination sequence, a green-skinned Orion animal woman. Interesting. She was Vina there, and she's Tina here. Ah, a hell. I promise no more Star Trek connections. You know, some of this is completely out of my control. You know that, right? So, Sam steps slowly outside the rocket, pistol at the ready, and we get... An unprecedented third Forbidden Planet alert. The exterior scenes on Altair 4 were greatly enhanced by a large cycloramic matte painting of the rocky landscape. And the Mars landscape of people are alike all over is greatly enhanced by it as well. Talk about a boost in production value. That is gorgeous. And that shot of Roddy McDowell climbing out of the rocket pistol raised defensively, with that gorgeous alien background behind him. It's just beautiful. Pure, pulpy awesomeness. Looks like a weird science or an amazing story cover come to life. Two men, two human men, presumably acting in some sort of official Martian capacity, approach Sam and calmly take the pistol out of his hand and toss it aside. One of these men is played by Vic Perrin, who also has a bit role in the fifth season episode, Ring-A-Ding Girl, but his contribution to the science fiction television genre is nothing short of profound. He was the narrator on The Outer Limits. That's right, the control voice himself. Itself? The mind of man has always longed to know what lies beyond the world we live in. Explorers have ventured into the deeps and the heights. Of these explorers, some are scientists, some are mystics. Each is driven by a different purpose. The one thing they share in common is a wish to cross the borderlands that lie beyond the outer limits. Most of Vic Perrin's credits were voice-based. You can hear him on a variety of cartoons from the 70s and 80s, including Scooby-Doo and Super Friends. His final IMDb credit is an episode of Johnny Quest in 1986, Oh, and uh, he um, did some voice work on Star Trek, too, including the aforementioned The Menagerie, where he was the voice of the Talosian Keeper. Oh, my God, these track connections are spiraling out of control at this point. Ah, hell. The other Martian guy is played by Byron Morrow, who played two different admirals on two different Star Trek episodes. No clips for these. I've got to draw the line somewhere and just move forward. Good just like I am. Face, body, everything. You're just like I am! Oh, uh, uh, no, no, f- forgive me. Uh, don't be frightened. Uh, my name is, is uh, S- Sam Conrad. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Conrad. We don't intend to harm you either. We've been wondering when you plan to come out. We've been waiting for hours. How do you know my language? We don't, Mr. Conrad. As you'll no doubt soon realize, you are speaking our language. Your language? Unconscious transference. You'd call it hypnosis of a sort. The Martians gently extricate Marcuson's body from the ship and offer to bury him. You were right, old friend. They are people. Just like us. 
I wish you'd live to see that. Oh, yeah, you know, that's sweet. You know, however, he would have seen it if you'd opened the goddamn door at some point in the several hours between the crash and when he died. Not cool, man. Not cool. Miss, you do have a name, don't you? I'm called Tina. Well, uh, Tina, will you tell the others how very appreciative I am? I, I was so frightened, so miserably Don't frightened. Don't be frightened, Mr. Conrad. No one will hurt you. No one will hurt you. You must believe that. I don't know. Tina seems a bit intense right there, doesn't she? Sam doesn't notice or care. In fact, as she turns to go, he starts to close the hatch, but then leaves it open so he can gaze flirtatiously at her. And she smiles at him. Wouldn't they make a cute couple? Aww. The next morning, the Martians present Sam with a brand new Earth-type house with all the creature comforts. Electricity, gas stove, running water, a full bar, even a TV. Though, I'm not sure what he's going to watch on it. <laughs> Maybe the Martian Chronicles? Fabulous. It's really fabulous. Well, we wanted you to feel at home, Mr. Conrad, do you? Do you feel at home? It's unbelievable. Thank you. We were wondering if you'd mind remaining here for a little while. You expressed an interest in seeing our city, meeting our people. But we'll go out and arrange that. Enjoy yourself, Mr. Conrad. Enjoy your house. Oh, uh, let me show you out. After all, it is my house. And then something odd happens. The two Martian guys basically high-five each other on their way to the door. I don't know, maybe it's because their recreation of an Earth-style house turned out so well, or maybe it's something else. Tina, I will see you again, won't I? Our boy Sam is crushing pretty hard, and it's kind of adorable, but Tina looks strangely, I don't know, not into it. She seems kind of sad. And some guy, I don't know, maybe it's her possessive boyfriend, answers for her. Of course you will. Mr. Conrad. The Martians leave Sam to enjoy his new digs. He closes the door behind them, then almost goes to reopen it, but doesn't. And this seems like an insignificant detail, but it'll carry more weight later on. If he'd try to open that door just then, well, let's continue. He pours himself a drink, lights up a smoke, and notices something kind of odd. There's no window in the kitchen. He tries to open the refrigerator. It doesn't open. Something is very wrong here. He goes back to the front door, tries to open it, and... Yep, it's locked tight. Hey! You locked me in! What's the matter with you people? Oh, you people? What do you mean, you people? I'm locked in! What's wrong? He goes to the living room and opens the drapes. Well, he tries to but the cord doesn't do anything. He yanks the drapes down and finds a blank wall behind them. A blank wall that suddenly slides open. A crowd of Martians is there, staring at him. Between them and him are metal bars. Why are you doing this? Why? Why have you locked me in here? Why are you looking at me like that? There's a small sign just outside the bars. Sam reaches through and picks it up. It reads, Earth creature in his native habitat. Now, that's a pretty shocking moment, right? Usually such reveals are punctuated with a musical stinger, such as... Or... On second thought, God, no. Or, since we've already heard it twice in this episode. But we hear none of them. Instead, the cue that was already playing just continues to play through the scene, which is a library piece called Light Rain by Marius Constant. Now, it works well enough as is, but it kind of seems like there should be a bit more oomph at that moment. They could have just layered a shot cue over it, like so. I don't know, it's just a thought. So anyway, 
Turns out Sam was right to be afraid all along, since he's now the new exhibit in a Martian zoo. Marcuson! Marcuson, you were right! You were right. People are alike. People are alike everywhere. Despite all my rage, I am still just a rat in a cage. People Are Alike All Over was written by Rod Serling, adapted from an existing short story called Brothers Beyond the Void by Paul W. Fairman, which was first published in the March 1952 issue of Fantastic Adventures magazine. And just like Elegy, it was already read aloud on Tom Elliott's podcast, this time by Brandy Jacola from the Inside Outcast podcast. So again, head over there if you want to hear it. The link will be in the show notes. It's essentially the same story, but only Marcuson travels to Mars, Sam Conrad is a friend whom he visits the night before he leaves Earth, and it's Sam who espouses the theory that people will be alike anywhere in the universe. And the Martians aren't telepathic. Marcuson picks up enough of their language to read the sign on his cage. Like Elegy, Brothers Beyond the Void feels like it could have come from Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. Now, I have no way of knowing if Bradbury influenced or inspired Fairman's story. If so, it's minimal at best. I mean, really, we're just dealing with the idea of a manned expedition to Mars and the Martians' underhanded response. Now, the idea of abducting and exhibiting an Earthling in an alien zoo is the real story point here, which never happens in the Martian Chronicles. It's interesting to note that the big kahuna of humans in an alien zoo stories, Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s Slaughterhouse Five, wasn't published until 1969, 17 years later. Maybe Fairman's story or Sterling's adaptation inspired Vonnegut? Now, we never find out if maybe Sam Conrad will eventually get a female specimen to share his captive life with, but hopefully the Martians will be as benevolent as Vonnegut's Tralfamadorians, who gifted their zoo human Billy Pilgrim with a Hollywood starlet for a cage mate. Mmm, Hollywood starlet. People Are Alike All Over holds a special place for me. It was the very first episode I ever videotaped, on Monday, September 16th, 1985. For some reason, KPTV12 here in Portland started with that episode and went forward from there, so my home taped collection starts there too. Now, aside from that connection, I really like it because it's a really good episode. It's not necessarily top, top tier, but that may be because it aired midway through the first season, which is just overflowing with excellent episodes. So I don't know, maybe it gets a bit lost in the shuffle for me. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. I like it a great deal. I just don't quite love it passionately, I guess. It's not a Serling original, so there's really no higher moral or lesson here, at least nothing overt. I mean, The idea that the Martians would put an intelligent creature into captivity for amusement or profit, and that humans would probably do the same thing if the roles were reversed, I guess that's an indictment against man, which would qualify as a quote-unquote message. But I don't get the impression that Fairman was trying to convey a deep philosophical message about mankind's failings. I think he was just using the concept to infuse his twist ending with irony, which I'm sure is what attracted Serling to the story in the first place. It's basically a punchline type of story, in that everything in the story exists in service of a single payoff moment at the end, which I guess describes a lot of Twilight Zones. And as a Twilight Zone, it also serves as yet another dark prediction that the space age could very well have catastrophic, even fatal results. I don't think Serling and company necessarily intended that to be the takeaway. That is, I don't think there was a larger message spread across all the space-related episodes, but it's a fact that more often than not, man's trips into space on the Twilight Zone end rather badly. 
The Arrow 1 crashed in the Mojave Desert and her crew, save for one, ended up dead. The X-1 Interceptor and her crew ended up uncreated through an unclear twist in time or space, or both. The rocket in Elegy ended up repurposed as a museum display for her taxidermied crew. The rocket, in People Are Alike All Over, crashed on Mars and was never heard from again. Her only surviving crew member captured and locked up in a zoo. Now, on the flip side... Allenby's ship made it back to Earth, as far as we know, and the stolen flying saucer from Third from the Sun presumably made it to uh, wherever it was going. I'm not going to spoil it since we haven't covered that one yet, but we will, like, real, real soon. Now, that's four out of six space missions that ended in disaster. Coincidentally, there have been four real-life space missions to date that have ended in catastrophe. Two Soviet missions, the Soyuz 1 and the Soyuz 11, and two U.S. missions, the Space Shuttle Challenger and the Space Shuttle Columbia. Now, before its five years are over, the Twilight Zone will suffer more troubled space missions and more casualties. But with People Are Alike All Over specifically, the danger really isn't in the space travel itself. Despite the fact that the ship does crash, the danger is in trusting the aliens. And I guess this could be interpreted as a bit of xenophobia on the part of the author, Paul W. Fairman, I mean, not Rod Serling, which could in turn be interpreted as a veiled racist slant. Now, I personally don't think that, but you never know. I don't really go that deep with it. And this applies to both the original story and Serling's teleplay. It's just a fun story with a great twist ending. Normally, there'd be some kind of don't let fear hold you back message, but here Sam's fear ends up completely justified. Damn it, he shouldn't have gone to Mars. Original music wasn't commissioned for people are alike all over. It was instead scored with stock cues from the CBS Music Library, and we get a lot of really familiar pieces that will show up again and again on the Twilight Zone. Aside from the aforementioned Mr. Death signature cue, which is actually from Bernard Herrmann's House on K Street, we are treated to four different cuts from Herrmann's Outer Space Suite, which, as I've stated before, is a favorite of mine. The one you're hearing now is Time Suspense. There's also Space Drift. plus two others, Moonscape and Tycho. Hey, speaking of the moon, there's also Bruliards by Marius Constant, which our pal Dr. Reba Wisner discussed in her Ithaca Multimedia presentation that we proudly presented right here on this very podcast back in March. Zone fans in the music scene are just coming out of the woodwork. We've talked about Nine Inch Nails and Skinny Puppy and, of course, Golden Suits in previous episodes, and now we have Space Monkey Death Sequence. No, really, that's their name. Space Monkey Death Sequence. Sorry, PETA. Their 2015 debut album is called People Are Alike All Over, and there are clips from the episodes scattered throughout the entire album. For example, why won't you open the door? I don't want to die in here. I want to see what I'm dying for. Take me out, will you take me out? Please don't don't be afraid, Sam. If I can restrain you, I can. If there's anybody out there, they'll help you. Minds and hearts, that means they're good souls. That makes them people. And people are alike. They're bound to. 
It's all instrumental electronic stuff, so there aren't any lyrics. The only voices that you'll hear are the dialogue clips. Probably the best description can be found on their Bandcamp.com page. Focused on texture and ambience, this album attempts to capture the feeling that the episode had on the creator when viewing it for the first time as a child. Now, I'm a big fan of ambient and electronic music, so this is right up my alley. See the show notes for a link if you're interested. It definitely gets the BLNS seal of approval. So in one corner, we have Elegy, and in the other, we have People Are Alike All Over. Both come out swinging, but in the end... People Are Alike takes it with relative ease. I just don't connect with the characters in Elegy, and it's way too similar to Ray Bradbury's Mars is Heaven for me. And yeah, parts of the music score grate on me a bit too. Meanwhile, People Are Alike has the eminently likable Roddy McDowell and the ridiculously hot Susan Oliver, plus a really nice set of library music cues. The crashed rocket set is really well done, plus those Altair 4 backgrounds are just plain gorgeous though not as gorgeous as Susan Oliver. Oh, and did I mention Susan Oliver? That should just about do it for this week. Now, if you've got a burning question, seek us out on Facebook or Tumblr. Just search for at ZonePod, or you can go directly to the source and email us at ZonePod at gmail.com. Now, that's for burning questions. If you have a burning sensation, that's, well, a whole different issue, and I, I can't really help you with that. Next week, we'll be looking at two more spaceship-related episodes, but there won't be a rocket in sight. Intrigued? tantalized? If you're just itching to find out more, come back in seven days for a soothing slathering of Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast. Until then, never turn your back on Martians bearing gifts. And doggone it, kids, play nice. Mars ain't the kind of place to raise a kid. In fact, it's cold as hell. And there's no one there to raise them. If you did. And all this science, I don't understand. It's just a job. Five days a week. Rocket. Man. And I think it's going to be a long, long time. The touchdown brings me around again to find I'm not the man they think I am at home. Oh no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man burning out his fuse out here. Hello. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time To touch down brings me around again to find I'm not the man they think I am at home Oh, no, no, no I'm a rock, it's man Rocket man Burning out his fuse out here alone And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, Between light and shadow.